I have now amassed enough of these interesting one needle knitting tools to do a comparison with you. They're really quite fascinating. These two are the classic vintage tools and you can see how very very similar they are. The one in my right hand wiggling is the k -tail knitter. The one in my left hand is the Grant version. They came out almost the same time. The literature for the Grant states that it was written in 1970. I haven't been able to find dates on this one, but it's very close to the same. I can't tell which one came first and why there were two companies in such obvious close competition, but there they are. And here's the homemade tool, one of several, that I showed you how to make in the other video. What I didn't show you is how to thread a tool where the yarn guide runs alongside. I've got this yarn threaded into a double eye bodkin, but any yarn needle would do. And I'm just going to drop it through. Might have to wiggle it a little bit. Here it comes. And now we're through. And actually, I like this tool at least as well as the store-bought tools. So if you're unable to find a vintage tool, all is not lost. Go to my do-it-yourself video and make yourself one. It keeps the yarn out of the way of your hand while you're knitting. Let's start a little knitting on it, just for a demo. They all start the same way with a slip knot. Pull back so that you don't have a lot of sloppy yarn. Push. Grab the loop with your fingertips. Pull back. In all of them, you can adjust the size with either your movement or with the placement of whatever there is to stop the size of the loop. In this case, the end of my bamboo stops it and it makes a good size. These two are a little different. They have movable, I'm going to call them beads, stoppers. It's not that easy to move them. It takes some work, which is probably by design because what you don't want is them flopping around while you knit, otherwise they wouldn't restrict movement and do anything useful. And here we are chaining with this one. But just a couple days ago, a friend sent me a complete set with instructions, which is very cool. And I discovered something interesting. While researching and enjoying these tools, I found out that some people just loved them. And some people, to put it politely, did not. And I think I figured out why. Two reasons, really. One I've already showed you in another video, but we'll reiterate here. These arrived with somebody else's trial chains and the original yarn that came with it. So it's pretty clear this person didn't progress very far. She didn't enjoy this tool. Look at the positions of the beads. This is worsted white yarn. If anything, it's a little bit heavier than the worsted that I'm using for this. And look where she has her spacer beads. Those make really short loops. And her chain's very tight. She may have based this on what works well for her, or worked well for her all these years ago as a crocheted chain to begin. But the action of this tool is a little bit different. And when I try to work into her chain, let's back up, I was trying to work in, at the setting that she was using, I find it very, very tight, even though these have been worked into before. The loop is so small that the tool tries to catch on the, the hairs of the yarn. Now this would be extremely tedious. <laughs> 
The other issue, I'll remind you while we're here, is that you must pull back the loop in such a way that this is the yarn supply. We must pull from this side to make a stitch. If I accidentally get turned and pull from this side, I get nothing but a knot. Very aggravating. Now look at what I'm doing. This is thinner yarn. This is thinner yarn. Admittedly, it's alpaca, which you usually do stitch a little bit large because it lofts so much. But look at the difference in stitch size between what we were using. And my stitch size is not aggravating at all. In fact, I accidentally unraveled a stitch here. Let me put it back and we'll stitch a little bit together. The first couple of stitches, it's hard to see anything, so let me just get them done. And it's hard to hang on to this part. There's that twist wanting to happen that I need to not happen. I'm doing the simple stitch or simplicity stitch. It's a classic stitch for this tool. Now watch. If I plunge all the way to the bead, which I am, and that's how we space it, and draw back, I don't really get as large of a stitch as you, as you would envision. Naturally, there's going to be some variation depending on the way you personally handle the yarn. Because this moment right here could be done a few different ways. But I'm going to advise newbies to this craft, if you're not already loving how it comes out, try enlarging your spacer by lowering the bead a little bit, enlarging your stitch size. Because I think that that is probably the main reason some people found this really difficult. Here's another tool that works. It resembles the fauché. It's really a machine knitting bulky transfer tool. Here's a picture of the real Fauché Easy Loop tool. And here's the modern day Leisure Arts Loop Crochet tool. It resembles the antique one without a bead. Here I'm working on a fingerless glove and ribbing. And let's use that opportunity to go over several pitfalls that you want to avoid. We'll also discuss some of the basic nuts and bolts. Some of this I've mentioned before and it'll be review. Some is new. Here I am working with ribbing and the stitch is formed a little bit differently. It goes under both of those first two strands whereas the simple stitch goes under only that strand. So we go under two for ribbing. Other than that, everything is the same. So let's talk about stitch size first. Stitch size is determined by the size of the loop in my left hand. And that is determined before we ever get that stitch in my left hand. If we need to adjust it, it's still adjustable before I go all the way through it. Did you see me shorten it? Now here's the main way that we size the stitch that plunge through stopped by the bead. If it's made the same way every time, obviously we'll have the same exact amount of yarn every time because it's a measured thing. But there are some ways that we can mess that up. For example, if I grab the loop too low and withdraw like that, I've shortened it. So you want to try to grab your loop and not get it twisted the way I'm doing, near the eyelet of the needle. Now we assure ourselves that it stays the same size. There are some needles or tools that you might make or buy that don't have a spacer bead. So here's another thing. If you draw back the same distance every time and then put a fingertip on the needle so no more yarn can flow through. You have also created a predictable stitch. And you would be surprised how easy it is
to want to draw back the same amount every time. However, if you draw back too much without thinking and you expect the spacer bead to size your stitch, you will get a nasty surprise. I can't use all this yarn. So I've made a sloppy stitch and I may not notice it right away. If I do, I should do that. Did you see me pull on the yarn and supply and it shortened up to be the right length? Because all of these things are likely to happen, particularly while you're still getting used to the process. Also, this stitch could grow at this point, even though it's already sized. If I pull in such a way, let me try to do it. I let extra yarn get into the stitch by being overly aggressive with my left fingertips. So I, if that happened, I would need to shorten it up, eyeballing the amount that has been in the other stitches. Now, to our benefit, to our benefit is one nice thing about this fabric. It's one long locked together chain stitch. So if I decide those stitches look a little bumpy, I can go back, make this my last loop, pull the last of the yarn. No, I'm sorry, pull the yarn supply back through the needle and remake those stitches without further ado. It's not a big, huge deal if you make an error. Here's another pitfall right here. I've mentioned this one in several places in these videos. You've got to get the yarn supply on the right side and you've got to get it feeding through the needle. Right now I twisted the needle slightly and I'm trying to pull yarn for this stitch from the previous stitch and that won't work. If it happens the best thing to do is pull back, find the correct loop, remove the slack, Orient your needle. Usually, since we're working from left to right, the supply line being on the right works better. And now I'm feeding into the supply. So that's pretty important because it, you'll get really stuck if you get that needle even slightly twisted. Even stitches caused by the same amount of yarn going in every time, either using the spacer bead or your draw back, or both. The easiest stitches are made when you use the spacer bead and you draw back just enough to use that amount up or slightly less in the next stitch. One more thing to keep in mind. Here's my yarn supply. It goes to a center pull ball. And you might think, fine, we'll just let it pull out as I work. Orient this correctly. I have not found that to be a plan. That produces enough stress that it's hard to get your stitches the right length. So what I do is pull a couple of yards out, not so much as to make a mess. But it'll sit on the table or on my lap. So I have this much free play in the yarn. I'll stitch that up. You don't want too much because it'll get tangled sitting there. But I want it to, com to flow with complete freedom. And not, at this point, I don't want to have to be pulling out of the ba ball with this movement. I want it to flow freely. It's surprisingly a lot of resistance to pull straight from the ball. And this is much easier on your hands and on the yarn and on the tool. Count as you go because if you didn't count you might miss the fact that that is in fact a stitch. Same is true at the beginning of the row. Let's turn and do it. If you forget your chain stitch at the end of a row you won't get a consistent rectangle.
And here's the way, this is a review I know, but here's the way to make sure you begin in the right stitch. It's not the chain you just made. It's not the stitch the chain is emerging from. It's the very next stitch right there. This turning chain, it tends to enlarge or sometimes shrink when you turn, depending how you handle the fabric. And that's going to make a sloppy edge down here if we permit it to happen, or an overly tight edge. So if you need to stop and adjust the size to make sure it's right, do so. And now we're ready to go. This is also the moment at which to make sure your needle is oriented. So where my left thumb is tapping, that comes out of a stitch. And the yarn, the supply should be off to the right. This is going to guarantee we get tangled up. This will guarantee that it fl flows properly. And there we go. Now let's compare the needles. The Grant needle and the smaller of the two k -tail needles. They are, I think, probably roughly the same gauge. The thickness of this shank, the size of the hole in the needle. The larger k -tail needle is definitely bigger, and I would strongly suggest enlarging the stitch which actually I've been reading the manual and it suggests that this spacer be pulled back farther. I'm going to need to do the adjusting off camera because it's taking some strength. You know this has sat for a long long time in the position it's in. There's one more tool I know of that's very much like these two but I haven't had a chance to work with it yet. It's a modern day tool sold as a loop crochet needle by Leisure Arts. So perhaps soon. This is the tool I mean, the Leisure Arts loop crochet tool. It has a needle at the top and a yarn guide at the bottom, but no adjusting bead. Now let's see how I do making a chain with the spacing that I suspect would be more effective. You see, you don't quite get the whole distance you think you will because there's a tendency for the spacer to stop you on this side before it stops you on the other side. And I don't see a problem with that. Just allow for it. This is certainly easier to chain with than the previous owner's settings were for me. By the way, we're working here with worsted weight yarn. At present, that would be called number four yarn in the United States. Aaron in the UK. Eight ply or maybe ten ply some places in the world. And you always chain one more chain than you need. Because when you turn and start working into the chains, that's your end turning chain. Make sure I don't miss any loops. Working the simple or simplicity stitch. Much better. Same yarn, all curly from sitting years chained up, and I'm not having trouble with splitting the old loops or trying to grab my new loop. Much, much better. You could really get a cramp in your hand trying to do it too tight. I think the way to go is to use this larger needle, if you have the choice of two, for worsted and bulky yarn, and the smaller needle for number two and number three yarn. Those would have formerly been known as sport and DK in the U.S. Be sure not to twist your chain. Because of the curliness, I'm not positive I didn't make any mistakes there. And I'm going to start out doing the simplicity stitch, but you've seen me do that quite a lot already. 
there's that whole coaster video for you to watch. So now I'd like to point out that one way to get a varied look is where do you insert the tool? If we inserted under both of the loops that are sort of on the top edge of the fabric as I hold it, we would get one kind of stitch. And we could insert through the back one of those loops as we were for the simplicity stitch or the front one of those loops. For the simple or simplicity stitch, we weren't inserting with reference really to the top edge of the fabric, but the side, the top of the side and using that loop. But some stitches involve using this loop, sometimes referred to as the front loop. And of course you're going to get a completely different look. Another variation is to choose your insertion position, but make a chain in between stitches. So that will make it taller and looser of a fabric. And then what you work into on the following row will also further affect the look. So in other videos, we will explore the possibilities, work through the stitches recommended by the manuals. Almost all but not all stitches involve this one extra chain at the end where we turn and begin again. If you don't do that, and some friends have told me, oh, I had that, but I kept making triangles, not rectangles. I think that might be where you made a mistake. If you think of it as knitting, it won't occur to you to make that extra chain because we typically don't in knitting. In crocheting, we typically do. And this has quite a lot in common with the structure of a crochet stitch. Quite a lot not in common too, but there's some similarity. Especially some, to something called slip stitch crochet. 